how'd you guys meet? We met doing a play together. I've been doing a play uh, called Lockdown, which is a devised theater uh, out of New Orleans. And Quest was a performer in it, and I was doing the, the projections. So, yeah, that was the first time we met. I think you can go into it a little more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, about eight years ago, 2013, and um, Lockdown was in its uh, most mature iteration. It had been, been, it had been building for about five years prior to that four or five years and so um, Jason came on and just helped us ramp it up he came in with the videography and it turned into like a multimedia type of situation whereas before it was mostly just performance and theater and poetry now we had some video and some other elements to it so yeah that's how we hooked up can you talk about the unique scene down there I know this is a little bit about y'all's past but there's something very interesting going on where you're from that area that style of music I mean we're from Texas, the South, so I'm curious about that type of theater, that experience. Can you give us a little bit insight about that scene down there while you were there? So, um, depends on which scene you're talking about. If you're talking about spoken word, theater, music, cinema, we got, you know, all of them are very New Orleans unique. But I can speak to about three out of four of those with a little bit of proficiency, a little bit. So, I'd love to touch on spoken word. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, um, spoken word uh, has always been a staple in our community for like the last 50, 60 years. But it oscillates in terms of like how many people gravitate to that center. And we've always had the kind of artists that are titans in our small pond or bayou, if you will. And, you know, big enough because New Orleans is important enough that the big uh, league artists, the Amiri Barakas, the James Baldwins, they got to come to town and when they do, they're going to tap in with the Kalamu Yasalams, for example, one of our great elders who's still out here doing his thing. And so Kalamu um, and that whole circle of poets in the late 60s, early 70s um, really held it down for that era. And then it's had other big um, epics like the Pizzazz community in the late 90s. You get uh, greats like Sonny Patterson coming out of that, if you're familiar. Um, people in the spoken word community, particularly in the South, but even nationally, they know about these figures because they end up being like, you know, giants of the South, giants of that, that particular movement. Um, it doesn't necessarily always translate to the mainstream, but that's spoken word in general, you know? You don't necessarily know that, you know, Sonny um, featured on 2 Chainz's album, Black Unicorn Poem. Um, you don't necessarily understand people like Jessica Care Moore, who would be like her peer, uh, who was on Apollo five times, was on Nas's album. So was one of my first mentors from New York, where I'm originally from, um, Abiyadun Oyewoli, the last poets. But people who are like adjacent to our community, whether that be R&B singers or soul singers or Afrobeat, you know, uh, founders like Fela Kuti, they know about the last poets and they know about Sonny Patterson and they know about them because the griot, the, the, the holder of the stories, has always been traditionally, um, you know, for lack of a better term, like royalty in any African community because somebody has to hold your stories. Your poet is that. So whether, you know, um, whether, uh, you know, Penguin or any of the big publishers acknowledge us, our communities hold up, you know, the spoken word artists as being, you know, paramount because they're holding the stories in ways that only maybe the rappers and maybe the singers are doing, but they do it in even more incremental intimate way and so um, we came together in 2008 and when I say we I mean me and some of the next torchbearers of that community which was uh, a slam team we put together a slam competitive porch you might be familiar with and our name was Team Snow or Team Snow as we're affectionately known and um, Slam New Orleans was the acronym we um, went on to win two national championships 2012 2013 um, you know that's nice lore for the the spoken word community, how it gets to the mainstream community is our little sister who was one of our stars in that team is somebody that more people have managed to hear about. Her name is Terriana Tank Ball of Tank and the Bangers, Grammy nominated, boom, boom, boom. So we've, you know, you get to that level because we had a community that built people and built talents like hers um, or helps contribute to their building uh, for decades, you know, and so build people like me. And so we all take our talent and then transfer it to a different pool sometimes. And for me, that was theater and that was now cinema because of my guy here. So, 
just a little bit. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted something to base the historical elements of where you guys are coming from voice-wise. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, There's one more element I'm going to speak to in a minute, and it's the uh, theater component, which ran adjacent to the spoken word component. And both of them are very much civil rights movement, social justice oriented. So while Kalam was doing his poetry thing, there was a great now ancestor named John O'Neill doing his devised theater thing. He gave us the tools for what became the movie Many Fires This Time, also for the devised theater that he and I met over. Bringing that to the next level, your element of bringing the visual to that theater, giving it another element, another voice, if you will. What was your experience diving into that realm, diving into that world? I know we're, we're kind of way back history, but we've got time, so I'm, I'm curious. Diving into film just in general? Yeah. Or but what, what made you touch on that realm, going that way? I think a lot of things maybe touch on it. Um, maybe touch on just becoming a filmmaker. One was moving around a lot, trying to find my place within these new places. And the constant was always film, was always TV, movies, music videos, because MTV was actually showing music videos back then. So that was a way to experience, maybe if I was living in New Jersey, you know, somebody from the South is now popping, like, outcast. So like, okay, that reminds me of being in Birmingham. You know, when I moved back to the South, now I'm seeing Nine Inch Nails. Like, okay, cool, that reminds me of being back in New Jersey. So, so film is always kind of the constant in a kind of nomadic lifestyle that I had when I was uh, younger. Yeah. Um, I like telling stories. I'm a visual person, so be, being able to put my ideas out there in a visual way, in a moving way. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, that's a really <laughs> I could go yeah, down a deep question. Hole. Open. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I could talk about. The type of films I make now are mainly documentaries, and the things that activate me as a filmmaker are stories of people who are either disenfranchised, looked over, not really appreciated. So like the first, one of the first things I shot in New Orleans was of John O'Neill, was a conversation with John O'Neill. And just kind of going back into his past and him talking about how he came up with device theater, how he came up with the story circle process, which we used in the film, uh, and everything that kind of went on with him trying to get the community, you know, educated in theater. So when I when I first heard about him, I was like, how come this guy isn't like in the history books, you know? So having stories like that and uplifting people who. Again, have been forgotten or not really appreciated. Those those type of stories have always really uh, attracted me. So, to tie it into this film, can you give the significance behind the title and why you went with the title of the film? And kind of tell us why you went that route with the title for the film. Yeah, I'm gonna pass out the quest. So, um, the title of the film was literally just like sitting on my shoulder. We were trying to come up with a title for weeks. We had a few that we kind of um, were trying to land on, but they didn't exactly stick or we thought they might not jive well with certain communities, what have you. So we... Um, uh, we're still brainstorming and you know I keep Uncle Jimmy or James Baldwin right there on the bookshelf behind me and you know right before the zoom starts I look behind and that book was sitting there the fire next time and so when I thought about it and I thought about all of the content in the film it deals with all of these these multiple fires you know of course the fire next time is a biblical reference you're talking about you know God said uh, no more water we'll send a fire next time um, as opposed to the floods after uh, I guess no was arc what have you right so after that whole story um you know we've got that kind of imprinted in the modern psyche you know anybody who grew up in a church you're thinking that's what's coming that and you know the allusions to hell you know and the allusions to like a an apocalyptic type of reality and that's a lot of what um the present has been knocking on the doors of if not absolutely in in some regards or some places and so you know he was talking about it james baldwin was in terms of like um 
particularly racial strife against black people in America, coming from all of the, um, you know, uh, tenets of white supremacy and state violence. But, uh, you know, we looked at this film and it was looking at that metastasized all through several communities, not just how it hits white to black, but, you know, um, rich to poor, uh, straight to queer, um, you know, um, white to any manner, any race, you know what I mean? Um, and so we went to so many different communities and saw how that fire looks in so many different places, in so many different ways. Um, in terms of what, you know, the systems of patriarchy and white supremacy and capitalism have left to this planet that we had to definitely say um, it was many fires this time. And so, you know, it was that. It was trying to speak for all of that. How many people did you talk to? How many people did you guys go and interview? How much footage did you get? I feel like there could be, I'm guessing, a whole nother movie just in the footage you didn't use. We actually didn't get that much. Uh, not, not as much as our other comrades that we met this weekend. Uh, originally, this was supposed to be on stage. So this wasn't supposed to be a feature length film. It was, it was devised as on stage with the music, with the poets, with the dance, but all, we, I don't think we really worked out how that was gonna play out, but in each city, I imagine it would have been something of something like the poet reciting their poem, and then whatever we shot at the workshop and B-roll of what and to it, localize it, like you, each venture you would go and do that fire of that city. Is that kind of what you were looking at? Yeah, it wasn't named at the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, so th that was kind of the. That's, that was uh, what we were operating under. Like, all right, Quest is gonna go up. He's gonna talk about New Orleans. We're gonna have something of New Orleans behind him. There's gonna be some music accompanying, accompanying him and there's gonna be some dance sprinkled out through it. So March 2020, after COVID, we made a decision. Okay, can we turn this into a film? It's like, okay, let's try it. So then the footage that we didn't get, get, we had to create. So we had to rely on filmmakers across the country and in Mexico to film these poets doing their poem. And then in New Orleans, me and a couple DPs and uh, Quest, we filmed his things in New Orleans. We filmed uh, the B-roll scenes in New Orleans using film and uh, digital photography. Um, digital digital film and um, yeah kind of kind of put it together that way that, I mean there's I think all the footage the best things you see in the film or the the best footage is what you see in the film I know some other documentaries have like 400 hours of footage and 200 hours have been shooting for four years but really this this is about a two-year project two two and a half yeah wow it's yeah. amazing because it feels like so much more it could like I'm, I'm curious then format wise how many different formats were you like you talked about digital photography and film yeah compiling that and turning it into what we see it seems pretty seamless what was the, the process of just getting those formats to click well thank you I appreciate that um, honestly it was it's the music I, I think free free feral pronounce your name right pronounce their name right I'm sorry um, they did the score and we've worked with Free on a multiple projects. Mm -hmm. And when Free came in and they listened to the poems, watched the poets recite their poems via Zoom, I mean, they were, like Quest said earlier, not in this conversation, different conversation, they would have feel the spirit of the room and just really imbue the footage with it. So, so it was music and sound design. I felt like really tied everything together. But we did use 16 millimeter, Super 8, film stills, and then we shot an A7S2 and an FS7. So, um, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how it came together. I just let the footage speak to me. And then the music and the sound design really helped um, tie it all. When do you feel like this became a film rather than just a theater project? When was that aha moment? Hmm. I don't know. I want to say the music. I want to say when we, once we figured out the order of the cities 
and figured out that to put the community voices first, which is always the conceit of the project. It was cool, though, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, it was COVID, yeah. It was, it was COVID when it came together, but, like, when when I knew, when we actually had, like, a film, that this this thing that we set out to do actually worked is when we had the Order of the Cities and the, really the music and the sound design. Because after a while, I'd just been look at, looking at the footage over and over again. Then once Aiden Dykes, who did the sound design... Once he had a first pass at it, I'm like, this is a brand new thing, and this feels like more alive now. So, uh, maybe maybe you have, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to clarify the question. Like, are you asking like when did he realize he had finished, like he had uh, culminated all he needed, or when did we make the shift from we want to do theater to we want to do a film? I think what what you were saying, I think okay. not the COVID part, oh. but when you realized you had the film. I got you. Yeah. I got you. No doubt. So I, I'd, I'd love to ask the film festival circuit, what is it like showing it to different audiences, showing this education that people may not have any connection to, may not realize what has gone on? Can you guys talk and touch upon showing it to many different audiences along the circuit? Well, um, y'all are the first ones we got to be in person with. So that's something that unfortunately due to COVID and um, probably other factors too, just like, you know, I'm a full-time high school teacher, so it's not like I can just, just jump out there like that. But when we knew we were up for this award, Gordon Parks Award, as well as, um, you know, this is our first opportunity to be in a room, so we're taking that. So I can't really speak to what it's like, because unfortunately, the only time we've been present so far was virtually. And even that was very powerful, just because, like, we've been cooking this thing down for, you know, months he's been doing that, and I've been, you know, building it up for, like, two years. And now to see it come to life, even virtually, was, like, really emotionally charged and really powerful and just like, wow, this is real. Um, but being in rooms with it, like, this has only happened once. So that felt good, but, you know, want a whole lot more of it. Yeah, I'll say, yeah. So we're supposed to, there was a film fest out in Seattle that we were the closing night film, which due to COVID, they canceled it. They canceled it in person. But even having that um, validation, so to speak, of we're the closing night film, they want to do a panel based off of this film. Just knowing that it moved them that much, um, it's pretty special. And then being nominated for the uh, Gordon Parks Black Excellence in Filmmaking Award, and having Gordon Parks be a reference as we're shooting, it kind of comes full circle, you know. And especially being here, being seen in other films that are nominated under the same category, it's been really special. So. We screened yesterday in the morning, felt the love, we get love when we send out our newsletter, you know, um, Facebook, Instagram. So even though we can't really be with the people like we want to be, it's still nice to see the comments and the, and the, the goodwill through social media and emails. To expand on that impact of Gordon and the nomination, knowing that Gordon's life was like you've talked about, multi-leveled, not just a photographer, not just a filmmaker, an author, not just a black man living in America, but impacted all those levels. Your film showcases the many different levels that you guys have been through in your own lives and maybe other kids can inspire to be. How important is it to have a recognition like that to showcase that your film shows another voice that maybe isn't out in the history books, isn't taught correctly, especially with what's going on in our country. Like I'm from Texas, we're damn near rewriting the history books where there's no colored people anywhere in them. How important is it also to make a film like this? I think it's very important. Um we went to a panel yesterday when, where they were talking about his life, Gordon Parks, and they're being too loud. Should we stop? No, I think you're good with that. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Uh, no, so yeah, we went to this panel yesterday when they were talking about Gordon Parks and his work, and he was a he was a photographer for life. So you went around the country. Well. He went around different countries, Brazil, France, um, and showed how they lived. I feel like we, 
I don't know if Gordon Parks ever made a documentary, but I would like to think if he were to make something, it would look, it would have this feel to where he would use his different skill sets, his different mediums. I mean, he was a musician, so I would like to think he might score it or he would have a heavy hand in how it sounds and how it looks and how it moves and tells the stories of the people that he's documenting with uh, in a humane and empathetic way. So, so yeah, I think it speaks to some of that stuff is just kind of innate within us, but that speaks to Gordon Parks like writ large. That even if you don't know, you're really referencing him in our images. You're still referencing him, you know. Um, I think the first time I saw American Gothic was his version of American Gothic. Like I had seen it, I had seen it like maybe in cartoons, but his version is the one that sticks out, you know? So things like that, if you grow up a certain age and around certain people, he just is kind of like the foundation for a lot of things, uh, at least for me, art-wise. It begun so much, yeah. 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 I was, um, I was, we, he, of course he's come up now because he has to, right? But it's one of those things, it's like a pyramid or something, right? And you just take it for granted until you realize like, oh no, actually this was a foundational work of architecture, foundational civilization that created a template for all the ones to follow, you know what I mean? And Gordon Parks is kind of like that pyramid. He's pyramidic for like uh, American artistry, for especially black American identity and artistry to the point like I had to recount and recollect now like, oh, snap, yeah, one of my first most pivotal black novels was The Learning Tree. Like, I learned a lot about black boyhood and masculinity and identity through his life experience. Oh, snap, he came back when I was in college and I read A Choice of Weapons and I remembered, like, oh, he was knife-wielding as a young man. So was I. You feel me? Like, I went through those same exact experiences of, like, resorting to violence to survive a violent, you know, um, terrain. And then realizing that this guy, and I always reference him when I talk about me having changed my trajectory, you know, from one that was like more influenced and impacted by, you know, street violence, which he also documented through the Harlem gangs and what have you, right? Um, to one that was like, I'm going to direct my energy elsewhere, and instead of a blade, my weapon's gonna be my pen. It's gonna be my fingers, you know what I mean? Um, through my writing. And so, um, all those basic things, um, just realizing that his shadow, he casts, is so humongous that you're in it whether you know it or not. He was a Kanye West and a Jay-Z and, and a Miles Davis of his many genres in his time. And so we are still impacted by that even when we don't realize it. So it's dope to see that come kind of full circle for us to be nominated with anything with his name on it because his DNA is inside of what we create. I love that sentiment. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for, for chatting with us. Um, sorry about the sound. I think that's kind of knocking us out. Um, but thank you for making the film and being bold to show what others may not know and giving us at least a, a glimpse of uh, our American heritage and the real American heritage. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having us.